we're very thrilled to have our speakers today with us. Brian Haas is an associate professor of psychology at the University of Georgia. He's a Fulbright scholar uh, from the kingdom of Bhutan and is interested in international multicultural education and understanding the links between culture, personality, and well being. His research is focused on understanding individual differences in social and effective functioning in humans by using a multimodal approach and incorporates multiple methods that include personality measurement and social behavior experiments and cultural assessments. A primary objective of his research is to produce result, results that improve the way people function within diverse multicultural settings. Kuba Krish is a, did I say that right, Kuba? <laughs> is a macro physiologist and specializing in large cultural, cross-cultural studies covering several dozen countries from inhabited continents. Cultural sensitivity applied to societal development and well being is currently his main area of scientific interest. Since 2012, Kuba is working at the Institute of Psychology at the Polish Academy of Sciences, where he currently holds a position of associate professor. In 2017 through 2019, as a fellow of the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, he joined Yukiko, is it correct? Ukiri's team in Kyoto University. In his work, Kuba cross, crosses the boundaries of cultural culture imposed upon us. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our presenters um, to get started on their presentation introduction to a culturally sensitive approach to measuring happiness across the world. Thank you very much, Jill. Uh, and thank you for very much for the, uh, the introduction. Uh, as Jill mentioned, I'm Brian, and I'm at the University of Georgia, and we uh, carried out this study within the last uh, few years, and we're really grateful to be able to have this opportunity to be able to share our, our work, and uh, it would be wonderful to receive lots of input from the audience today and uh, about this project and about our types of questions in general. Kuba, do you want to? Briefly, in, thank you, Jim, for the introduction. Please let me also mention that the study we are presenting is the effects of efforts of teams from 50 countries. So we are uh, honored to give a talk, but the study is an effect of collaboration of many, many people. And uh, this, what you will hear, is the um, um, product also. Great. So here's our title and us. And get us going. There we go. So broadly defined, we are interested in the way that people think about happiness. And of course, as people, not just scientists, we have our own common understanding of what happiness is. These are some definitions that are commonly used in, uh, in the way that people think about happiness. One way to, that we can define it is, is simply feeling good or content. Here's a definition from psychology today, a state of well-being that encompasses living a good life, one with a sense of meaning and deep contentment. Wikipedia, for example, defines it as positive or pleasant emotions, ranging from contentment to intense joy. And lastly, the Encyclopedia Britannica defines it as a narrow sense when good things happen in a specific moment, or more broadly, as a positive evaluation of one's life and accomplishments overall. Okay, so we can already get a kind of tone here that there's a diversity in the way that definitions of happiness tend to be formulated. These are just a very uh, quick pass over some definitions that are commonly used. But this is really relevant. This is really relevant in terms of the way that researchers try to tackle this question about trying to measure happiness. And it becomes incredibly more complex 
when we start to ask questions about how people that live across the entire earth that have been raised in different cultural contexts are how happy they are. And this is, of course, an important question. It's an important question to us just as, as people living in our everyday life. We all kind of commonly accept this notion that we're, we strive to be happy and that this is an important characteristic of the way that we make decisions and the way that we go about our lives. But as scientists, we are interested in this question about, well, are there some type of characteristics in a society or a country or something about the ecology that corresponds to being more happy in a particular place in the world? That all seems like a um, like uh, in, intrinsically interesting questions that, uh, that have been asked for decades within the uh, psychological science. And of course, we're all probably familiar with every once in a while, there's some headline that comes out about the, the new rankings of the countries around the world, about what country in the world is the most happiest and the, why they're, what particular characteristics of some country corresponds to being so happy in that particular country. And this gets a whole lot of attention and it, it, it attracts uh, our attention uh, because we perhaps will start to make policies that are in accordance with these countries that find them, themselves at the top of this list. If a whole bunch of happy people are in a country that, um, that has a particular uh, societal structure, then perhaps we should learn from that and structure other societies and grow and change other societies in ways that are similar to that very, very happy country. And so here, just for example, from the most recent World Happiness Report, these are some of the countries that frequently find them themselves on the top of this list. Finland, Denmark, Iceland, Switzerland, Netherlands, and then here are some of the countries that frequently find themselves at the bottom of this list. Afghanistan, Lebanon, Zimbabwe, Rwanda, Botswana. Okay, so this list exists and it, we pay attention to it. And a further question that's, that tends to get asked quite a bit with these data is the following. What sort of cultural characteristic may correspond to being, to having a, a, a to, to, to being in a country to, that is particularly happy? Is there some type of metric that explains a cultural phenomenon that corresponds, that can predict how happy a particular culture or country is? Well, one that has come up from time to time is individualism. And I'm sure many in the audience are, are familiar with this cultural construct. It broadly describes actually characteristics of being self-reliant and having an independent way of thinking. And sure enough, there is quite a bit of research that indicates that on a cultural level or a country level, individualism is a decent predictor of levels of happiness, of country level levels of happiness. Okay, so let's let's just dig a little bit further into the way that some of these patterns have been demonstrated. So this is one of the most common ways that happiness on a worldwide scale has been measured using the following scale. It's called the Satisfaction with Life Scale, it's developed in 1985, and it has been used many, many, many times. And so let's just look at the items. These are all of the items in the scale, total, total scale right here. In most ways, my life is close to my ideal. The conditions of my life are excellent. I am satisfied with my life. So far, I have gotten the most important things I want in my life. If I could live my life over, I would change almost nothing. Okay, probably makes some sense, corresponds to 
thinking about one's life in a, in a relatively positive way, this should kind of on face value correspond to happiness. But let's just look at it a little bit more detail. When we look at the phrasing of these items, they have a great deal to do with one's life as, an, as a unitary construct in a sense, as a, as a solitary unitary construct. When we're thinking about how satisfied one is with using their own individual or their own uh, life as the sole metric and the sole focus of uh, making this assessment. And so this way of thinking, sure enough, makes some sense quite a bit in terms of where on the earth this scale was developed. Scale was developed in an American cultural context. And sure enough, it seems to resonate quite a bit with a Western educated, industrial, rich, democratic way of thinking. However, there are other ways to think about happiness. And the other ways have been developed to be able to measure happiness. And so this is one example. This is a scale called the interdependent happiness scale that was developed recently in 2015. And here, these are some of the items that are included in the scale that are used to measure happiness in a, in a slightly different way. So I, here are the items I make significant others happy, although it is quite average, I live a stable life, I do not have any major concerns or anxieties, I believe that I and those around me are happy, I believe that my life is just as happy as that of others around me. Okay, so I, th I think we could all get a sense that the tone here is a bit different. The tone here is not only about is, isn't just tapping into one sense of happiness or uh, uh, of oneself, but also those people that are close to them, perhaps, uh, perhaps people that close friends, people close community, one's family. And so sure enough, when, when scales such as this are used to measure happiness, the association between happiness and individualism is no longer significant, is, is attenuated. And so here I have some empirical evidence of this. So this is a paper that we all, that we, that we um, wrote uh, a few years ago that sought to kind of uh, empirically demonstrate this rationale that I just tried to explain. So here, what we have on the very left is personal life satisfaction. Personal life satisfaction is what was measured with the satisfaction with life scale. And as you can see, across uh, uh, 49, 50 or so countries, there is a significant positive association between country level individualism and personal life satisfaction. This is a replication of lots and lots of prior work. However, if we measure happiness using a different approach, personal interdependent happiness, so that's that last scale that we looked at, this interdependent form of happiness, the association between happiness and individualism is no longer significant. Furthermore, we can also change the wording of these scales such that the primary target of each of those items is no longer I or me as an individual, but is one's family. So uh, my, uh, I, my family is, is satisfied with their life. This is an example of a, of a change. And when we do that, the association with individualism gets further attenuated for both life satisfaction and the interdependent happiness scale. So this gives us additional support. This gives empirical support for this notion that 
people think about happiness in, in different ways and that it is not a one size fits all um, match in terms of the way that people think about happiness. If we change the wording in slightly different ways, and we uh, the people uh, people uh, people respond in, in different ways uh, in terms of um, uh, being linked to cultural phenomenon such as individualism. So that gave us the, these pr prior findings gave us this motivation to try to develop a, a methodological approach that we could measure happiness in different places in the world, but that each resultant score of happiness, metric of happiness, would be tailored to the way that people think about or idolize value the uh, type of happiness within that cultural context uh okay so i'm going to hand over the baton to my my friend and colleague here thank you ryan um, i'll take over from here um Please let me wrap up to start my uh, perspective or my narrative uh, from the point uh, that you finished yours. Please let me try to wrap up it, uh, this, what you said in a, um, from a different angle, presented from a different perspective. So previous studies showed that um, individualism predicts societal happiness. We have noticed that uh, individualism actually does not predict societal happiness. I mean, predicts, but if you conceptualize this, if you conceptualize societal happiness as a um, happy society of individuals, but if you change understanding of happy society to, for instance, society of happy families, then individualism is no more a predictor of uh, such defined societal happiness. Uh, then started the question, okay, so if we want to run uh, cross-country, cross-cultural comparisons of happiness, then which type of happiness we should employ? Should we take this individualistic approach to happiness and then compare countries on this, uh, uh, on this uh, kind of, uh, or on this type of happiness? Or maybe we should try to compare uh, societal happiness based on measures of happiness that are more typical for collectivistic cultures. We realized that for such a dilemma, there is no good simple answer. We cannot just say that one scale is better than, the, than, in, than another one. I mean, each scale may be better for a different type of a society. So we realized that it may be necessary to suggest a solution that will combine different types of happiness into one measure. So the question appeared, how to combine? How can we estimate, how can we know which type of happiness should be taken into equation uh, in a given society? And in the current presentation, we suggest a solution that we do not argue is the best, the only, and uh, forever uh, everybody should use it, but we think about it as the first step towards making uh, uh, such comparisons more culturally sensitive. And the philosophy of this, what we will suggest here, is to uh, ask people not only about how happy they are on a given type, on a given facet of happiness, but also to, to ask people across cultures, what is the ideal level of happiness, of given type of happiness for them? And then we aggregate both declarations on these ideal levels of happiness within a given culture, declarations on actual levels of happiness within a given culture, and we combine them into one measure uh, in such a way that we employ weight. We attribute as much meaning of a given type of happiness to the ultimate um, score of a given country on this measure, as much people wish this type of happiness to be important for them. Uh, okay, so with this idea in mind, 
we collected um, data on four types of happiness. Yeah. These four types of happiness are obviously not the only possible four types of, or not the only uh, types of happiness that people can feel, conceptualize, experience around the world. These four types of happiness, please think about them as example four types of happiness that we employed to somehow illustrate how our idea may work. So these four types of happiness that we employed are the most common in psychological science and probably in social sciences uh, uh, facet of happiness, which is called uh, uh, life satisfaction and is measured with uh, dinner and collaborators scale of uh, satisfaction with, I mean, satisfaction with life scale. Here on this figure, we call it life satisfaction of an individual. And we call the scale personal satisfaction with life scale, because as you, Brian, mentioned, we also uh, employed similar scale, but for families. Uh, we also employed the mm, scale and the concept uh, that was coined by our Japanese collaborators uh, a few years ago by Yukiko Uchida and uh, Hidefumi Hitokoto. And they presented arguments that in the Japanese in Japanese culture, happiness is experienced, conceptualized in a little bit different way than in this Western uh, um, uh, way that is commonly measured in the currently employed uh, rankings. They call it interdependent happiness. And you, Brian, briefly introduced this uh, a while ago. And we additionally were thinking that taking an individual as a subject of a measure is again, is a kind of individualistic legacy in um, uh, well-being studies, in happiness studies. So we made a little bit artificial step, but anyway, I, I believe it's helpful in understanding happiness, uh, even if not the ultimate argument. We made a little bit artificial step and we make, and we additionally mm, uh, measured, studied uh, family life satisfaction and family interdependent happiness. In this way, we could think about this personal life satisfaction with life scale as the most individualism themed uh, happiness out of these four that we are studying here and interdependent happiness of family as a most collectivism themed concept out of those that we are studying here. Okay, and in our study, obviously we asked people how much do they feel happy on each of these four types of happiness. And additionally, uh, we took the instruction from uh, not very broadly discussed, but for us very inspirational study by Dina Ernapaskola and Oishi Zokota and Su from already over 20 years ago, in which, they asked participants of their study uh, to answer questions about happiness, not, not only as they actually feel their own happiness, but also to indicate how much they think an ideal or perfect person would agree with each, this type of uh, uh, happiness statement. Uh, Brian, ne next slide, please. Apart from asking about these four types of happiness, separately actual levels and ideal levels. We also, in our study, asked about uh, emotional experiences of our participants, uh, separately positive, separately negative. There were 30 different emotions. As far as I remember, 16 positive, 14 negative emotions. Um, we also, in our study, employed external, I mean, publicly available measures of uh, uh, phenomena that is um, up till now still labeled individualism collectivism. I mean, this course were um, um, suggested or offered are offered by Hofstede, by Minkov. Uh, the individualism collectivism like phenomena quantified by Schwartz. In his case, it's uh, intellectual and affective autonomy versus embeddedness, uh, and our open society idea. Another reconceptualization of individualism from a few years ago. This was course taken from external uh, data, external data sets. And within our study, we had also uh, questions. Let me check the time. Uh, we had also questions about self constructuals This is, uh, or cultural models of self actually. This is a psychological proxy of individualism collectivism. Uh, a few years ago, assembled and very nicely described by Vivignolas and collaborators. And they argue that there are at least eight different uh, aspects of individualistic or independent self-construal versus interdependent self-construal. 
here I believe there is no big space for discussing them. I'm just signaling that there is variety of these psychological translations of individual and collectivism into um, self constructs Next slide. Okay, we have collected data. Uh, I mean, we as a big research consortium, uh, a lot of people from around the world were involved in the study, and we are, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are just uh, honored to present the study, but the, the effect is uh, an effort of uh, work of all the people who are uh, uh, involved in the study. So we researchers from, actually there were 50 countries, but in Bulgaria, they did not administer uh, ideal uh, happiness measures. So it's dropped to 49 for this particular analysis. Uh, we collected data from over uh, for, from almost 13,000 participants, uh, on average 250 uh, participants per country. This was convenience sampling. So you cannot look at the data we collected as a good proxy or as a very good proxy of a, uh, how happy a given country is or citizens of a given country are. It's just a, let's say, play with the data that can help us illustrate the methodology, the idea of a culturally sensitive approach to measuring happiness or comparing happiness across cultures. Next slide, please. Okay, you have seen a map. Now, please have a look at this uh, list of countries. You Please check if your country is here. Uh, in the meantime, I'll just explain that uh, for Indonesia, the data was not... I mean, they were too far from uh, good enough quality. So the, for most of the analysis we present here, we excluded Indonesia. Had Indonesia been included in our analysis, the picture of finding would be uh, substantially the same you know, picture. So personal question to you, uh, I mean, to the audience, if you do not see your country on this list, and if you would like to join us in our further studies, we are currently running another large scale study, and we are planning to repeat studies every two or three years from now on, please feel encouraged to join us. Please feel encouraged to contact us and uh, uh, we will do our best to help you if it will be uh, for us uh, possible to help you join us. If you see your country on this list and if you feel like joining us, please also contact us. I mean, we are thinking about professionalizing, making this uh, data collections more reliable, broader. So we also are now uh, ready to have more samples than one from a given country. So please feel free also to, to join us if you see your country here. All right, next slide, Brian. Okay, basic findings. Before, before we move on to, the, uh, to this idea of culturally sensitive happiness and how we measured it and uh, uh, what we found out based on it, I would like to present two or three, I don't remember now, slides uh, that illustrate the problem. I mean, with our data, with this data collected from these 50 countries, or 49 countries that I uh, a while ago announced, I wish to illustrate you the problem that we try to face, that we try to address. Uh, so on this slide, you can see how people idealize, or what people idealize more. Life satisfaction on the right side of the slide or interdependent happiness on the left side of the slide. Uh, the higher the bar, for instance, on the right, the more people idealize life satisfaction over interdependent happiness. On the left side of this figure, the larger, the longer uh, bar downwards, the more people idealize interdependent happiness over life satisfaction. In between, there is a number of countries that are um, uh, in which both types of happiness were, according to data we collected, idealized uh, to the same extent. Please don't ask us about specific countries here. I mean, these are not representative data. Please remember this, that we are running convenience sampling. So we have a picture that for this big number of countries and for this big number of participants teaches us something, but there are countries that sometimes just are on such a figure in a different place than you could expect. And the explanation to every single country is probably uh, too complicated to, to find out. I mean, it's just a, a, a matter of probably, I don't know, specifics of sampling in a given country. 
yeah, so please don't ask, I mean, you can ask and we can try to answer these questions, but please don't be surprised oh, that uh, sometimes some countries are uh, um, located in different places than you would expect. Okay, what you can learn from this uh, figure, at least what we learned from this figure, we learned from this figure that yes, people across cultures have different idealizations about what is more important for them, whether life satisfaction or interdependent happiness. So again, the problem that I described at the beginning of uh, my, part of my part of talk is evident. I mean, depending on the country, people prefer idealized different type of happiness, right? Um, okay, the second, the next slide, next slide, Brian, please. Oh, this is challenging for me. This is, wow. I was preparing this slide, so for me it's very simple, but I have still problems with explaining it. Please, if I mess up too much, please feel free to ask questions after the presentation. Um, okay, this slide plots actual levels of life satisfaction and interdependent happiness in the sample of um, across samples we, we collected in our study. And this dashed line represents a hypothetical relation in which life satisfaction would equal interdependent happiness. Uh, this uh, solid line represents the actual relation between life satisfaction and interdependent ha happiness in our data. So this is what happens in our data we collected. In, uh, it's illustrated on a solid line. And on the dashed line is the situation when both types of happiness would equal each other. Why is it important to think about this figure? What, what we can learn from this figure, what we learned from this figure? Uh, first, I'll tell what I learned from this figure, and later on, I will try to explain why, uh, how I learned it. I, again, I apologize if it will be too complicated. So what we have learned from this figure is that life satisfaction, so this most commonly employed scale in international rankings, underestimates happiness as compared to interdependent happiness for those countries who are low on actually life satisfaction, but I mean, on life satisfaction, but actually on both types of happiness. So uh, life satisfaction makes countries that are lower on happiness yet lower than actually they are. Mm. This is a conclusion and now, now please try me to make explanations of how this uh, uh, conclusion can be taken from our data. Uh, Brian, please, please show the next slide. Uh, so here I try to illustrate the potential um, distributions or potential slopes for actual data. Again, dashed line is the line in which life satisfaction is exactly the same as interdependent happiness in a given country. And solid lines represent, for, inst for instance, on the left upper uh, part, illustrates the situation that uh, life satisfaction systematically underestimate uh, interdependent happiness across all cultures, across all countries. The second slide, I mean, the up in the middle, is the situation when life satisfaction all the time overestimates interdependent happiness across all cultures. Uh, upper right figure illustrates this potential situation where life satisfaction would overestimate happiness for countries that are high on LS in comparison inter to interdependent happiness, um, and so on and so on. Okay, I think that maybe the next slide will be easier and I can come back here. Thank you, Brian. Uh, here, I hope I'll be able to make this explanation much clearer. Please have a look at the two countries from our data set. Uh, one of them is Switzerland, this upper right part of the figure. And now I added dashed green lines that are mm, uh, uh, showing us where is Switzerland on actual life satisfaction and on actual interdependent happiness. Please have a look that Switzerland is exactly on this dashed line uh, um, indicating the equality between, between life satisfaction and interdependent happiness. If you will have a look at Switzerland's position at the actual life satisfaction, you will find out that it is 6.20, let's say. If you will look at the uh, position of Switzerland at the 
interdependent happiness uh, scale, you will also see that it's 6.20. So once again, no matter whether we measure life satisfaction or interdependent happiness in Switzerland, both measures will locate Switzerland at the same level, 620. Hmm? So both measures are probably equally good uh, proxies of happiness in Switzerland. However, if you turn to Japan, which is bottom left side of the figure, you can see that if you employ life satisfaction scale for Japan, you will find out that Japanese people report their happiness on the level which is slightly above 4.5. But if you take uh, Japanese citizens' uh, declarations about their interdependent happiness, you'll find out that Japanese people declare their happiness to be 5.3. So it's almost full point above uh, life satisfaction. Once again, if you take life satisfaction as a measure of happiness, then you will, I would say artificially, depress scores of Japanese citizens on their happiness. Because if you could take interdependent happiness, which is a typical way of experiencing happiness in Japan, you will find out that they are way happier on interdependent happiness than life satisfaction. That's why I'm saying that the conclusion from this figure is that life satisfaction underestimates happiness as compared to interdependent happiness for countries that are low on life satisfaction. I believe I don't, I mean, I don't want to spend more time in explaining it. If you wish to ask further questions, please uh, be patient till the end of our presentation. We'll open space for questions. And of course, please feel free to contact us and um, write uh, emails to us. Please also try to read the paper in which we try to explain it. Okay, next slide. Uh, that would be me. It's, it's your turn. Right, right. okay. I'm going to explain the way that we calculated this culturally sensitive form of happiness. If we look down here, what we can see is LS individual actual. Okay, so that I use as a reference point at this point to be able to <clears throat> signal which scale has been used to produce most of these findings of uh, where levels of happiness across the world have been <laughs> compared to one another. There's a satisfaction with life scale that uh, that measures the, the way that people think about themselves on an individual target level. Okay, and as uh, we described in previously, we measure we asked respondents to report how much an I, a perfect or idolized uh, ideal person in their culture would respond to each of these scales. So we use four different scales. <laughs> and we used the responses of those items the, uh, the idol uh, for an ideal person to capture cultural level norms of happiness we 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 speculated that if the if people idolized a particular type of happiness that meant that that type of happiness is valued more within that context than a other type of happiness where they responded that an ideal person would not be very high on this type of scale. Okay, so we used each of those scores for the idolized versions of happiness to be able to weight each type of happiness in in terms of their self-reported levels of happiness. So I remind you, we have of four four different types of happiness, and then we ask them to one respond in an idealized form, and then also to respond to all those scales 
in a actual self-report way. The very top here, we have the calculation of a weight that is used to uh, adjust each person's life satisfaction score. What we have here are all of the idolized versions, right? So here we have life satisfaction for the ideal, life satisfaction for the individual ideal. And that is divided by the total amount of idolization for every single form of happiness that we've measured. And so what we are left with is in a sense, a proportion, proportion of how important out of the entire scope of happiness as we are measuring it, how much of that entire scope of happiness is made up of life satisfaction on an individual level. And what we get here is a weight. And so each of these, because there are four different kinds, can be up to 25%. And we're, uh, uh, we do this for every single form, and we get a, a weight for each type of happiness that we use as a proxy for how much that particular type of happiness is valued in each particular cultural context. We then have that score, we have that, we, we have that, that weighting value, and that weighting value is used to adjust each individual's actual responses. So that's what's on the very bottom here. What we have here, you can see this subscript here is actual. And so these weights are used to adjust their actual life status, their actual responses to each of these scales. So just for example, for example, let's say that as a, uh, we get a, we get a, uh, a value that is under 25% here, that, the, that in particular, in this particular culture, that we see that people are saying that actually, as compared to everything else, every other type of happiness, life satisfaction on an individual level is really not that important. These one, these other ones are more important. Then we're going to get a weight that is under 25%, let's say 20% or so. And, and then that score, that 20% is used to adjust their actual self-response, self-reported response. And so, um, and, and each of these weights are used to be able to adjust each of their self-reported actual score. What this figure shows is all of these weights that we have. So these are not these are these are what we used to, to adjust each respondent's score, each individual respondent's score according to their indigenous culture. So let's just look at one here. Let's look at Ukraine. What we're looking at in Ukraine here are these different bars, right? And on, on the bottom here we have the what what these bar colors correspond to. But first we see a big dark blue one. This means that in the Ukrainian context, in terms of our data, in a Ukrainian context, the satisfaction with life, uh, with the family as the primary target was the most valued. And so those in, so individual subjects, individual respondents from Ukraine, with their self, their actual self-reported levels of happiness, they they get kind of a boost. They get a boost of uh, of how much the, uh, in the, in their responses to the satisfaction with life on the family scale. Each of those self report those actual re responses get bumped up. And then let's look at the pink one, this pink one here. So that is in, interdependent happiness on an individual focus. That The fact that this is a bar in the negative direction means that those self-reported scores 
for participants from Ukraine are getting de-weighted. They're not considered as influential to, to their overall happiness as the blue is the dark one, dark blue one or the the dark red one. Okay, so this just this gives us kind of I hope a sense of the way that these weights are used to be able to adjust each respondent's score. What I think this figure also does is gives a overall picture of the diversity that exists in terms of how much particular forms of happiness are idolized across different countries. You can see that the pattern of these bars varies quite a bit from, uh, from country to country. What we then did was try to situate our results within the context of existing research that has used the satisfaction with life scale to <laughs> characterize how happy countries are, how much happy, and, and to character to perform to, to provide a rank order of countries according to their happiness. What we have on the right side of this table is the ranking that would be the case for this traditional approach of simply using the satisfaction with life scale for each of these countries. And we can all, we, what we have on the left side is the new ranking that we found according to this adjusted uh, uh, happiness score that incorporates all four of them and is adjusted according to those idolized weights. And as you can see, that there's some cohesion, there's some cohesion in terms of the rank order, but there's also quite a bit of movement. You can see, for example, that Norway and Malaysia moved quite a bit, and that is the primary reason is because respondents in each of those countries reported that the their idolized version of satisfaction uh, of a of the, of the, on an individual level the of the satisfaction with life scale was relatively lower than each of the other one each of the other scales that we used so because those scores were in a sense deweighted their uh, uh, adjusted culturally sensitive happiness score uh, shifted quite a bit Here's just a further list of these uh, uh, of this rank order, uh, uh, all of the countries in our sample. And as you can also see, what we report here is the correlation with the experience of positive and negative emotions. And so we use this simply to provide some additional context and, and empirical support that indeed our new approach does correlate with the experience of positive emotions and negatively correlates with the with the experience of negative emotions and this uh this gives some uh further empirical support that that indeed this these adjusted scores also tap into a uh, also associate with other variables that we believe should be correlated with uh with happiness i'm gonna Hand over the baton to my colleague again. Thank you, Brian. Uh, okay. Um, at the uh, table you can see now, you can see, again, on the left side, culturally sensitive happiness uh, uh, being a regressed on either individualism, collectivism, meta factor. I'll explain it in a while or on eight different um, facets of uh, self constructs And on the right side of the um, table, you can see the same analysis uh, or findings from the same analysis, uh, but for satisfaction with life scale um, being regressed. So again, our approach versus uh, this traditional one, most commonly currently employed in international rankings um, and comparisons. As Brian, signals at the beginning of our talk, 
happiness, societal happiness, conceptualized as uh, happiness of societies of individuals. I mean, of, conceptualized as uh, societies of happy individuals, not happy families. Uh, such type of um, uh, happiness is correlated with uh, individualism, collectivism, and in our data, it was also correlated with individualism, collectivism, meta factor. This meta factor is a combination of uh, Hofstede's, Minkoff, Schwartz, and our open society measure, which are very highly correlated with each other, and was uh, also associated with four uh, facets of uh, self constructuals in our data. Uh, for self constructuals because this was exploratory study, we employed the Bonferroni correction. So, uh, yeah, if, if you're analyzing uh, uh, p thresholds, please remember that uh, here in this table you see this p thresholds uh, corrected uh, um, by Bonferroni correction. So, okay, uh, coming back to less uh, statistical language. In our data, the most commonly employed measure of happiness by now in social sciences is again quite visibly correlated with various markers of individualism. Whereas our proposed measure of societal happiness, the measure that is culturally sensitive, turns out to be much weaker associated with individualism, collectivism. In fact, only one, only one of these eight um, uh, facets of uh, psychological individualism collectivism was uh, statistically significantly correlated with our measure. Others were not. All right, next slide. Okay, to sum up what we told by now. People across all cultures do know what is happiness, but they differ a little bit in how they conceptualize happiness and what is actually happiness, how they feel it. Um, if so, then cross-cultural, cross-country rankings of societal happiness are or most or majority of rankings of societal happiness must be biased towards certain type of happiness unless they acknowledge somehow methodologically uh, this diversity of concepts of happiness. Uh, with our suggestion, we try to address this problem. We suggest, we propose that in order to overcome this problem of different conceptualizations of happiness, researchers and policymakers should weigh how much, should measure not only how much people actually feel given type of happiness, but also how much people across cultures wish to feel a given type of happiness. And then based on these two types of measures, we and policymakers could um, adjust actual happiness scores with preferences, with idealizations of these different types of happiness to calculate culturally sensitive um, measures of happiness across cultures. We don't argue that this is uh, already finalized, uh, final suggestion and uh, good forever. We just think that it's an incremental improvement. Uh, we don't say that previous measures, previous studies are uh, uh, not useless, uh, are, are useless for comparisons. They are informative for sure. Uh, with our approach, we suggest that we could make these comparisons that, that are being run now better, more culturally sensitive, if we also ask people about their ideal level of happiness and, and we take it all into, into consideration of these international rankings of happiness. Uh, next slide, Michael, uh, Brian. Uh, we have described this um, uh, reasoning and data in a paper that was uh, published in published online in 2022. It was printed in 2023. So, if you wish, please, uh, if if you wish to learn more about what we talked uh, talk, talked, please uh, turn to this paper. Uh, 
this paper is uh, published in an open access mode, so you don't need to pay to access it. So please feel uh, encouraged to go and just read uh, this what we wrote. Next slide, Brian. Future directions. Uh, these are two last slides. I mean, and the, uh, I mean, three last slides, but the third one is just thank you. So two last slides, uh, two more minutes of your attention, please, if you still have energy. Uh, this is what we presented to you today is about happiness. But good life, I believe that good life is more than just happy life. Happiness is a key component, the most important component, fundamental component of good life, but not the only one component of good life. Um, in philosophy, in social sciences, maybe less now, uh, we discuss, or philosophers since 2000 years discuss what is good life by saying, at least Western philosophers, uh, since 2000 years discuss whether good life is to live a happy life or to live a meaningful life. In social sciences, in uh, psychology for sure, we quite often find out that happy life is strongly correlated with meaningful life. So there is no big uh, literature yet on the differences between these two, yet on these differences. However, uh, however, there is one study. I think it's quite under noticed in social sciences and um, for me it was eyes opening. So I like bringing it uh, to, to our presentations. Um, and the part of the study is on the right side of this figure. Yeah. Okay, let me start with the left side. On the left side of the figure, you have a, an example plot of the association between uh, GDP per capita and happiness, societal happiness. This particular figure is taken from Spruk and Kasielewicz from 2015 uh, paper, and it illustrates this, what you will find out in almost or in probably every large scale study on societal happiness. This is that richer societies or citizens of richer societies report higher happiness. I have not seen a single study in which societal happiness would not be correlated with GDP per capita. And in this, in this correlation, depending on the study varies, but it's usually above 0.50. There is a paper of Shigoish and Dinner from 2014 from Psychological Science, in which Shigoish and Dinner document that, log transfer, I mean, that GDP per capita is negatively related to meaning in life. Once again, citizens of richer societies report lower sense of meaning. Huh? On this figure, what, this is what you can see. One slope for happiness is up, slope for meaningful life is going down for GDP per capita. Brian, please press uh, a button. In this data that uh, Shigoish and Adiner were uh, uh, analyzing, they found, it, it, this data covers uh, 130 countries, they found out that societal happiness is negatively related to sense of meaning people reporting different in given countries at the level of minus 0.33. It's not super strong, but as for two types of happiness that we commonly assume that are quite strongly positively correlated, such finding, this minus 0.33 for me was like, whoa, the, it's so interesting. It's so it's so different to what we usually think about happiness and meaningful life. So uh, what I want to say is, what I want to show, illustrate with this slide, is that happy life is different to meaningful life, which maybe for most people is not surprising, but for me as a social scientist who was usually finding out they're positively correlated, it was very surprising and eyes opening. This means, for me at least, and I, I would like to encourage you to also start thinking, considering this way. This means that maybe we should a little bit change our approach to subjective well-being. Uh, Brian, next slide, please. Uh, what I mean, uh, in most studies of subjective well-being, uh, maybe not in most, but in many studies uh, directed at uh, subjective well-being, you will find the approach that was initiated by Ed Diener and collaborators in which actually subjective well-being is being treated as equivalent of happiness. Okay, it was not originally treated by Ed Diener and collaborators, but in the literature, you will find out that many, many followers do it. 
So in the literature, subjective well-being is quite often equated with happiness. And there is an approach that other components of good life, like sense of meaning, sense of harmony, sense of, sense of spirituality for some people, and many other, other aspects of this what constitutes our good life, they are just lowering happiness. That happiness is uh, functioning as an ultimate dependent variable of our status. Based on this previous uh, slide, in which I was showing you this uh, opposite effects uh, of uh, wealth on societal happiness or societal sense of meaning, I wish to encourage you to start thinking about subjective well-being uh, in a way that we present here on this uh, right side of this figure. This is that happiness is only one of several concepts or components of subjective well-being. And actually, um, each concept of well-being, subjective well-being, is interdependent with other concepts of uh, well-being. Um, but for each person, if, if we continue, if we employ this philosophy that we today presented with Brian to you, uh, to happiness, but we, if we employ, if we copy paste the same philosophy and start thinking about uh, subjective well-being in the same way, in this culturally sensitive way about subjective well-being, then you can imagine that asking people around the world, for instance, but also across individuals, it, it can be also uh, informative and uh, important, again, in, in improvement to th studies uh, of subjective well-being, then we could start asking people about ideal level of happiness, ideal level of spirituality, ideal level of harmony, ideal level of meaning, and then adjust our comparisons of subjective well-being to the ideals about uh, happiness, meaning, harmony, and spirituality. I guess at least one of you is now wondering, hey, but probably people across the world wish to maximize happiness. It's obvious that we just would indicate that happiness should be maximum level, have meaning should be maximum. No. I mean, we could theorize it. I mean, I see some good reasons to theorize that people could wish to indicate that ideal level of happiness is maximum level, but the data we collected suggests that it's not, that people across cultures have different and substantially different ideal level of happiness, but this is another issue, not for today. We are working already on the paper about it, so uh, maybe next webinar, I mean, not, not next, maybe next year, we could present it on webinar, just suggesting. All right, um, last slide, Brian. Okay. Um, I feel obliged, but I also want to uh, um, say that our study was possible, maybe not possible, but was supported by uh, uh, Polish National Science Center, which was uh, an, in a project that was originally financed by the Northern uh, Financial Mechanism. Um, yep. And once again, thank you for your attention. If you wish to join our studies, please feel encouraged to contact me or Brian. Here you can see QR code. This QR code is to my web page on which you will find also uh, our other materials uh, and contact to me. So please feel encouraged to join us. Thank you for your attention. Uh, yeah, I think there is time to start questions uh, session. It's late, we took a lot of time. Thank you so much, uh, Kuba and Brian. Excellent presentation. Certainly a reminder of the importance of understanding cultural context when measuring happiness. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, now is the time for us to have our question and answer period. And we invite the participants, if you have any questions, please do ask. Um, you're welcome to also raise your hand. Uh, feel free to turn your camera on, your microphone on, or write your questions or comments in the chat bar, and we will be sure to address that. It looks like we just had some comments. Um, one from Joe Sergi, I'm not sure if he's still with us said your algorithm of CS happiness makes good sense, good thinking and well done. Um, looks like there's just some comments about some different countries. If you have any, oh, we do have a question here. Johannes, feel free. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, excellent. Okay, thank you so much, Brian and Kuba. I really enjoyed listening to your talk. So I have one thing I, didn't quite understand which is the weighting that you did was that 
individually that you um, weighted each individual's responses by the weights that you calculated um, by the individual answers, or did you do that for country averages? The way the weights are calculated for a, on a country level, and so everybody who lives in a particular country gets the same weight. And did you think about doing that individually, or would that be possible with your data? Uh, because I would think, I mean, that way you could even take account of the variation within countries. You know, because otherwise you basically assume that people are similar enough culturally that you can use the same weights for everyone in the same right. country. I mean, it's a good, it's a, it's a, it's a good question, and it's, it's a, Brian, it's a different. Yeah. It's a different, it, it would be a different um, result. I mean, what we get there is a individually sensitive level of happiness as opposed to a culturally sensitive. Exactly. Well, but then you could still check for cultural differences after, you know, checking for, I mean, you could still um, point out differences between cultures, but then still maybe you would even get stronger effects than, I guess, I don't know. I mean, it's just an idea that I had and because it wasn't quite clear to me. So I'm, I'm really not sure if that makes so much sense, but maybe it's an idea. And maybe if I may ask another question on the graph with the dashed line and the solid line. So when you interpret the dashed line, which is basically just the um, 45 degree line, right? Brian, Where... can us back to this uh, yeah. thing? Um, and th then you said, well, values above the line mean that the life satisfaction measure underestimates the interdependent happiness. I mean, I get that, but isn't that a bit probably a bit too strong of a statement because the wordings are different. So in my view, the wording for the interdependent happiness question items were more, um, well, were less uh, extreme, less um, towards, you know, they were more about averages and I don't feel concerned and I, you know, so they are not tapping into really the euphoric state, but more, you know, people being contented. So I'm not sure if, doesn't sound really right to me to say, um, like for Japan, one underestimates happiness. It's more like, um, the relationship, the correlation, and the, the, the solid line certainly, I think, um, has the interpretation that there's a difference between the two. And the slope also, is, you know, the interpretation you gave, I think, makes sense. But saying that one underestimates the other, I think, is probably too much. So it's like saying one, the, the pattern shows that one is a sort of more reliable estimate, but not a valid estimate of the other. I'm not sorry, I don't really know how to express that better. Johannes, I think I understand your uh, intention. And uh, please let me try to respond to you. And then please let me know if I understood you correct. My response is, if your comments were uh, good point, then probably we should have the, uh, these two lines parallel that the gap between dashed line and solid line should be the same gap across all cultures, right? Mm -hmm. In our figure, we find out that at the upper right side of the figure, these two types of measures are not far away from each other. But for mm -hmm. cultures at the bottom left, there is much bigger difference, statistically yeah. already significant di difference. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, this bias that I read in your question, uh, this potential bias that I read in your question would be only a bias of a group of cultures, not all cultures. So mm -hmm. again, it's, uh, okay, we can discuss it and we can try to figure out what's going on specifically behind these questions. Uh, but I would be still ready to defend mm -hmm. that point that it's um, uh, like this, that this type of, this Western happiness, if we, if we try to measure it uh, for Japan, it's just uh, underestimating this, what Japanese people feel in their 
indigenous way of feeling happiness. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Johannes. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, Dabasaki, are you able to ask your question? I'm happy to ask it for you. Moment, if you'd like to unmute. Okay, I will ask it for you. Uh, it says, thanks for the presentation. If the main argument is that individualistic measures are inadequate in measuring societal well being, I'm curious as to why and how the family was chosen as a unit of measurement, given each family is unique. And the family as a unit may also share the same weaknesses of individual level measurement. I will try to address it. Uh, thank you, Dabasaki, uh, for your question. Um, let me start with uh, saying that you're right. I mean, uh, it is uh, not the only possible um, uh, grouping uh, uh, unit that we could employ. And obviously, we could ask about not only happy family, but happy, I don't know, happy village, happy uh, district, happy country, happy organization. Um, when we were designing this study, uh, and now still, I'm thinking it was a good choice. I mean, if you, when you run a study across cultures, you need to try to ask people about things that are as universal as possible. And uh, I am not sure if, then, if there is any more universal unit of analysis, I mean, collective unit of analysis than family. And I'm fully aware that families differ across cultures, that there are different forms of families, different understandings of families, that there is higher and lower relational mobility across cultures. But out of the all possible grouping units that we could select, family seems to us the most universal. So remembering about all the limitations of this choice, we decided to study family happiness. And this is what we learned from our study. I mean, this today's presentation show a part of what we learned from our study. Thank you. Dabasaki, I hope that answered your question. Feel free to uh, write a follow-up question if not. Any other questions or comments? Okay, good. Well, with that, we would love to uh, thank our speakers again um, for your time and for your effort. I really, greatly appreciate your work. Um, and hopefully, as you mentioned, you're, we'll be glad to have you back with us in the future to share your future research with these goals. Um, as a reminder to everyone, this webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube page and presenter materials will be posted on our members only forum. Details will be sent to you all via email along with the option to become an ISFALS member and information about our upcoming conference in August, which we hope you all will attend. Brian, Kuba, thank you again so much uh, for your time and for your effort in preparing this webinar and your research, fascinating uh, information. We hope to have you back again, like I said, and hopefully you'll be interested in presenting again in the future. Please continue to keep us updated on your research progress. With that, we will sign off and say thank you again to everyone for joining us. Uh, have a good day or evening from wherever you're just tuning in from. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all, take care.